that's when the channel started really growing. And I was able to go from under 20,000 subscribers to over 100,000 in six months. And I always tell all of you about the power of niching down. And today I'm at VidSummit talking to a content creator in the beauty niche who niched down extraordinarily narrow and had massive success. Gabby, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and tell them a little bit about your channel? Yeah. Hey guys, so I'm Gabby and my channel is called Glam Girl Gabby. I am a beauty YouTuber, but I focus specifically on hair content and even more specifically, almost all always on fine hair content. That is extraordinary in terms of how narrow and specific you are in terms of your niche. Did you find that challenging in order to grow and what's your growth been like lately? Yeah, so... I didn't find it challenging in, in, in order to grow. In fact, I found that the more niche I got, the faster I grew. I had one channel, so I had really bad alopecia and mm -hmm. I had one video that I made about my alopecia and I, I had a self-inflicted alopecia. It's called traction alopecia. Mm -hmm. And so I made a video called my hair loss story. Don't do this or it will happen to you. And the thumbnail was just of my face, no writing, super tight with a huge bald spot. That video went viral. And then from there, I had a lot of engagement and questions on hair loss, fine hair. How do you hide it? How do you cover that? What are your tips and tricks? So I started making a lot more videos about fine hair. I ended up getting contacted by a plastic surgeon who offered to do a hair transplant surgery for me. I made that video and vlogged the whole thing. There was a lot of crying, a lot of emotions on that video. So of course that video blew up too. And then the whole thing as my hair loss was solved with the hair transplant, I started making a lot of tips and trick videos for women that are struggling with hair loss. It's a really vulnerable topic. It's a topic that people don't talk about. And it's also a, a topic that affects millions of women. So as soon as I became the voice of women with fine hair and how to make, give the illusion that the hair isn't fine and that it's really beautiful and lush and luxurious in a really easy way, that's when the channel started really growing. And I was able to go from under 20,000 subscribers to over a hundred thousand in six months. In six months. So from Z like, wait, 20,000 to a hundred thousand in six months. Yeah. You beat my record. I went from uh, 20,000 to a hundred thousand in about roughly, I want to say 14 months. So you, you, you did it about maybe twice as fast as me. You beat my record. <laughs> that's crazy to think that yeah yeah but there's a lot that you did very well and there's a lot to unpack there i think a lot of people would quickly dismiss it oh well you had a viral video of course your channel rose we know a lot of one hit wonders who they they make a viral video and then they never are able to repeat that success in fact a viral video you could live in the shadow of a viral video how did you escape yes. the shadow of that first viral video and not um especially since you no longer had the hair loss journey to capitalize off of you've moved beyond that you have wonderful hair today and you, you know you had that transformation yeah. how did you not lose connection with the audience yeah. when you no longer were in their shoes and how did you get out of the shadow of your viral video so the viral video you think you want a viral video until you have it and it can be a curse on your channel and on your content and creativity so what happened with the viral video is that i suddenly became the hair loss girl. Uh, and so what did I do? I doubled down. I tripled down. I made another and another and another. And I started collaborating with Matt Dominance, who's also a video about hair loss. And I started talking about hair loss solutions, why you have hair loss, first signs of hair loss. And I became this hair loss girl. But truthfully, I'm an industry makeup and hairstylist. I have 16 years of experience. I've worked with celebrities. I've traveled the whole world. And I was like, man, this sucks. You know, yeah. I'm bored. And every time I would make a video that was not about hair loss, it would tank. Yeah, you wouldn't get the views. It's like, okay, you became known for this. Yeah. The audience signed up for this. Yeah. You gave them this, you know, and okay, promises were made. People were like, okay, but I came for this. Why am I getting this? So yeah. the, the audience felt disconnected. How did you address that? How did you get past that? Yeah, so what I had to do is like, I was on a yacht and I had to turn the yacht right against the tide, I had to start making videos that were connecting with people that weren't about hair loss. So fine hair was a really easy pivot because women that have hair loss have fine hair. They kind of work together, but fine hair is much more broad. Trying to, to create 
something really impressive with fine hair is very hard. So I was able to use my skills from the industry and all of my experience to really teach and help women do that. So I kind of pivoted towards fine hair. And then when that pivot started, it, it started working well. But I think what really elevated the channel was the moment I made a mindset set shift mm -hmm. about my channel. I stopped thinking about keywords like fine hair or hair loss or hair transplant. And I started really thinking about these women that were watching my channel, how old they are, where they shop, how much they know about hair, if they wear makeup. And my audience is not glamorous. My audience are moms. I'm a mom. They want simple solutions. They want to feel great. They want to do it themselves, but they don't want it to be complicated. Yes. Right. And as soon as I created that avatar, fine hair or not, I started making videos that were really appealing to that avatar. And instead of focusing on the keywords or the long tail keywords or exactly how they're ordered or how close they are to the front of the title, I started making these titles where any woman with hair who doesn't know a lot about beauty has to watch this video. Exactly. You, yeah. you understood your audience better. You yes. proved that you understood your audience better. And I'm so glad you brought this up. People, people get very bogged down with keywords. And when you're starting out, it's a good place where you don't know what to do yes. to get some focus, some clarity. It's something to do, but it's not the, it's not the thing that's going to get you past your 10,000 to your 100,000 is not going to be the keyword. So it's going to get you from zero to 10, but not from 10 to 100. What's going to get you from 10 to 100 is how deeply you understand the audience yes. and how well you're able now to relate to that audience and yeah. deliver for them. Because when you were making those other videos that weren't about hair loss, yeah. you weren't making videos really for the audience. You were experimenting, but it wasn't yes. based on their, a deep understanding of the audience. What were those other videos that were underperforming? Yeah, so what I found on the, on the platform now is that if you make a tutorial style video, like how to do natural ways. Right. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. And I think 10 years ago, that was enough. Agreed. Right. And now people are like, yeah, been there, done that. Saw it on TikTok 325 times. Don't care. Or if you're making a product video, so say the new Dyson comes out, well, maybe Dyson's a bad example because there's a lot of search like that. Yeah, has oh, a lot yeah. of it's, buzz. it's like Dyson is like the iPhone of like hair products. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So let's say like the Layfin, for example, is another blow dryer that a lot of people don't know. I think 10 years ago, you could say Leif and Swift, new blow dryer launch, unboxing and review, and you could get views. Yeah, I hate if that you, title. <laughs> if you title a video, how to do curls, how to do a glam pony, how to do, you will not get views. So you can make videos about that if you want to make videos about that. But when you are content planning, you have to really think about What's going to stop someone from mindlessly scrolling when there is so much saturation of content on their feed mm -hmm. and you have to be really creative with a very strong, effective thumbnail and an even better title. And I can go on about this forever. I'm like the yeah, title yeah. queen. Yeah, no, you are. I mean, I've seen the titles. I want to yeah. ask you, I want to ask you something about this because this is great. This is great for the audience. Something, and it matches a lot of what I've been like trying to help people. So it's great to hear from someone who's gotten the success out of it. Yeah. What I what I want to know is this. The market is saturated with a lot of content in the beauty niche and you niched down further just to avoid some of that because there was not as much yes. of a demand around fine hair specifically. Yes. We see a lot for curly hair, natural hair, yeah. fine hair. There was a gap in the market. Yes. There was an underserved audience. The thing I always say is underserved audience there. Yes. When it when it came to that. What I want to ask is, in your niche, was there any kind of abundance or saturation of high quality content to serve that audience? For the fine hair? No, no, there wasn't. And that's what I call, I call the, the hole in Google search. Mm -hmm. I would research and research and research. And I was always looking for these holes in Google search. Yeah, these gaps. We call them now, yeah. YouTube made a research tool and now they call these content gaps. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And if you can fill that gap in a way that makes people feel like you can relate to them and like 
you have a relationship with them in the way that you communicate and talk to them, you instantly got yourself someone that's going to not only watch the content, but is going to engage with the content Mm. and become like a part of this amazing community that you can grow. I think that that's super important. And I think that that's incredibly powerful. I've been introducing people to the difference between value and quality. And I think you mastered it because you found a content gap. You found people who no one was trying to serve them. So no one was creating value just for them. Yes. And then instead of giving them something mediocre, you gave them something tailored to them. You understood them. You understood what they would perceive as quality and value. Yeah. And then you did that. Can you talk a little bit about uh, consistency? Uh, How much were you uploading when you grew from 20,000 to 100,000? How much were you uploading? Yeah. So I think this will shock a lot of people because so many people think you need quantity. You need to feed the beast, right? Feed the beast, feed the beast. Right. But for me, it was always about quality. Mm-hmm. I always, always upload every six days. I wanted- Oh, so it's consistent on a weekly. On a weekly. So I try to upload six videos a month, but I will always upload one video a week. I try to do six days. So right before it gets to that seventh day. Right. And um, I'm very, I'm very consistent with it. It really, it's have, my full time job now. Have you ever missed? A, have you ever missed a week? No. So you've never, never missed. missed a, a week. So you're so consistent that you ever missed a week. And that's the thing. I think that people, even when they hear quantity, I always translate that to consistency. Yeah. You found the balance of how much was right in your niche. Yes. To maintain the quality. Yes. That you have. Let me ask you something. Yes. With the team that you have behind you. Could you add another video or could you do 10 videos a month or a hundred videos a year and maintain the quality? Yeah. So having spoken to you, Roberto, and being inspired by so many of these incredible creators that I would watch and look up to. And every day I was doing my makeup with my laptop there on the bathroom, watching you guys. Um, The biggest thing that I've learned in the last month is that you once you're ready to scale and I didn't feel ready to scale until I hit a hundred thousand. Smart. Right. Now it's about having a team and I, I don't have a team. I'm 100% alone. I do editing. I do scripting. I well, that's right. It. You have a team in your business. You have a team in your business, but not in your content. Yes. I'm in that same boat of like, I have the team for my business on the back end, Yes. but not the content. I'm still solo. That's like, but yeah. So for scale, you can see where the team comes in. Yeah. And I think I, I was interviewing editors last week. And now that I have editors, I can double my output. So mm. I could, I could do two videos a month. So catch me next year and we'll see where the channel right. so, at. So no, I could definitely see that because then if uh, you meant two videos a week, two videos a week, yeah, right, at two videos a week, that gets you to your hundred videos in a year. Yes. And see, that was um, a, a huge YouTuber, Marquez Brownlee. He, like he shared that with me in an interview that that's kind of like, a big deal is like when you can get to the point where you can make 100 high quality videos a year, yes. you can dominate your category and your niche yeah. in YouTube because you have the right balance of consistency. People always showing up for you. You have the previous watch history in the algorithm because you know, like, all right, I'm going to feed the algorithm every week. It's time. It's like, it's hungry. I'm going to feed it every <laughs> yeah. week. But if you start like feeding it twice a week, it's starting to get fat. It's going to want to come to you. It's yeah. Like, uh, I'm like, I'm going to go where the food is. I'm going to go where the food is. So you feed it twice a week. Yeah. You feed it twice a week, not after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> but so that no, so is uh, super interesting. What was the process like in terms of looking for an editor and finding an editor for your YouTube content? How do you trust somebody with your edits after doing it so long? Yeah. You know, it's a good question because I'm still working on that because I did find someone that is an editor in the beauty space. I think it's important when you're looking for an editor to find someone that's in the space that you're in, because if you are editing gamer content, it is not at all the same as editing beauty content. So that's something that's been important to me. I want to see your beauty portfolio. I want to see how you go in and out, your nuances, your B-roll. So I've been, I've been interviewing beauty editors and I just found someone. So that's, 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 we'll see how it goes, but the way that this company works that I that I was looking into, they're called VidPros. Mm-hmm. They ha- set you up with an editor that's good for your niche. And then they do all of the edits. Then they send you a preliminary edit. And you can scrub through the video and make notes right on the video of things that you want changed, where you right. want to be removed. So I'm going to start with them next week. So I could let you know how that goes next week. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to it and everything like that. Maybe 
um, I might need to try them out myself and maybe I do an honest review of VidPros and like, yeah. let's like find an editor. Finding an editor is so hard, especially so when you do it yourself. You know the content better than anybody. You know your audience better than anybody. Yeah. Uh, and I think you do a great job with knowing your audience and knowing what they would like. So I can see where there'd be like handing that off could be uncomfortable. Yeah. Let, let me ask you something. You brought up a great point about every niche being so radically different and editing beauty content being different than gaming content. Is there anything that you think is different about the beauty niche in uh, YouTube and social media than other niches out there? Like specifically, like, is there just challenges that only beauty creators would have? Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges that I have had is that when you're in the beauty space, there's an expectation that you look like a bar, like you're perfect, like you're Barbie doll. doll. Mm -hmm. You're perfection all the time and as a makeup and hair artist for so many years having worked with big celebrities and everyone looks the same when you take everything off ah everyone does oh everyone so see has, this is the secret this exposed yeah right <laughs> Mask off. Yeah. everyone has frizzy hair when they wake up everyone has under eye bags everyone is tired at times or has acne or whatever and sometimes for me the hardest part of being a beauty youtuber is this incessant pressure to look perfect on camera and i get comments every day about how can you give us advice if your eyeshadow looks like that or maybe i made a choice that wasn't the best aesthetically on camera that day or maybe there was my hair had a little bit of frizz getting ready to shoot the videos is brutal in the beauty space like some days just to be camera ready and yes. not get killed in the comment section takes me like two and a half hours oh that's and, a that's a lot of prep. I I do not go through that. I do not go through that. As you saw, my my prep even to do this type of multi cam thing was very minimal. Yeah. Well, it's the yeah, it's like even the lighting has to be perfection because if the lighting's off at all and it changes the the makeup slightly, and I know that from being from set set work. Yes. But I'm setting it all up myself. That can be a lot of pressure. That's and harsh. I think the hardest thing too for me is that sometimes, and I and I feel it in the comment section. There's such a, and, and it's silly to say this, but there's such an aesthetic focus that I think sometimes people lose the, the meat of the information. because Style over substance. Yeah. It's like, it, like, let's not talk about how I look in the comment section. Let's talk about like what you learned today. Let's talk about the actual <laughs> content. Instead of talking about me, let's talk about the actual content that you were watching and let's do that. Like, yeah, no. Yeah. There's I, an objectification sure. of beauty YouTubers and being mid thirties and an intelligent woman, it bothers me it that should. we can't have intelligence and beauty. Why does it have to be so vain? No, that makes perfect sense. And I definitely appreciate you saying that. And that is a unique challenge specifically to beauty or even being a female content creator. I can imagine, yeah. you know, it happens every time I have a collab like this yeah. in the comment section, I have to go through and I have to delete stuff. And blah, 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 blah. it's like, yes. it's a uh, pretty, I, I end up finding new band words. It's uh, yeah. it challenges my creativity. I'm like, Oh, there's new words to ban. And you know, even when it's a compliment, sometimes it can be annoying. Like mm -hmm. I really try when I'm talking to young women because they're really in society, there isn't this representation of these strong female leaders as women, right? And the first thing we say when we talk to these young women is, oh, oh my goodness, you're so pretty. And I try really hard to say like, wow, that was a smart idea. Or I love how you built that Lego tower. What made you think about that? Instead of just, I like your dress. You're here so pretty. And a lot of my comments are that you're so pretty or, or you're not pretty or you have an ugly nose or... And oh, it's wow. like, Ugh, you know what I mean? And I know that I'm in the beauty space. It seems hypocritical. No, but not to me. Like, yeah. I mean, I guess like, I, I don't know if it's the time I grew up in or the way I was raised or something like that, but we actually used to, at least in my memory, we used to focus a lot on like people's abilities and accomplishments a lot more than their aesthetic. But yes. even when we became teenagers, we were like more impressed with what people, you know, could do yes. and what they had done. And so your achievements and your accomplishments, not that nobody cared about your looks. I'm not going to sit here and say that. I mean, like, it, was the, it was the 90s. It's like, no, we did, like, but I, I feel like there was an emphasis on like just being capable. Yeah. And I, I feel like in social media, everything becomes optics, becomes yeah. like facade. And so I guess one of the things that I want to like start to, um, you know, end with is 
how do you deal with the mental health aspects of what you do as a uh, creator? You run a business, a successful business outside of your YouTube channel. You have this massive success on uh, YouTube uh, that you've got very rapidly, but it comes off the back of a lot of hard work yeah. for years and years and years. But you also, you know, manage and maintain a, a family. Yeah. Like what, what do you do in terms of protecting your mental health and setting boundaries? How do you take care of yourself? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is that YouTube, for me, I've always seen it as a business, not a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I think that has helped me a lot. I don't, I don't, I don't always have my camera on me. I don't always have my phone on me. I don't record my kids. I don't see my identity as someone on YouTube. YouTube is a means for me to share information that will help other people. But I very much separate that from YouTube being me. YouTube is what you do, not who you are. Exactly. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Gabby, for sharing all that um, with us. I guess one thing I would definitely ask you is what can I do more to uh, help content creators like you? Oh, that's a good question, Roberto, because you're doing a really good job already. Oh, thank you. I guess, I guess something that, that would be helpful, especially when you're starting, because it is a... It's a hard thing to start rowing. Yes. You know, it's just putting in place, and you do already do this well, but perspective. Because I think when you start on a social media platform, you really think that it's going to be like six months and you're going to be huge. And it's not. It really is something that you make a video. You, you can't allow yourself to have perfection paralysis. Like you really have to make a video Put it out there, even if it's not the best thing in the world. And it's not going to be because it's the first time you did it. Yep, 100 crappy videos. Right, 100 crappy videos. And every single time you launch that video, you objectively look at it and think, what can I do to make the next one a bit better? Yeah, 1% better every time. 100 every crappy videos, time. but 1% better every time. Yeah. yeah. So incur I think it, you encouraging the younger creators to just keep going, keep trying, keep doing it, keep experimenting. Because eventually you'll figure it out. Yeah, and that's my that's my hope for people. Um, I think one thing I do want to ask you um, about that specifically is when you started. We talked about how you went from twenty to one hundred thousand in six months. How long did it take you to get from zero to twenty thousand? Oh, from zero to twenty thousand took me two years. Right. So two years on the struggle bus. Yes. And then you figured it out yeah. and you had your moment. How many videos did you make in those two years? I made over a hundred videos. Ah, and there it is. hundred so, crappy videos. hundred <laughs> crappy videos, everybody. And again, I'm not guaranteeing that video 101 takes off like it did, you know, for Gabby, but you got to give yourself a shot. You got to take those chances. I do want to encourage more new YouTubers, small YouTubers, content creators, podcasters, streamers, to experiment, put yourself out there, give it its time. Yeah. And I think that even doing collabs like this, where we talk more about it, creator to creator, I think that's going to help a lot of people. Thank you for sharing your story. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you're checking out my playlist of the best tips to grow on YouTube. And I will catch you on the next one. Stay awesome. Bye.